Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar in partnership with Baxi today. Thanks everyone for joining us. Just a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we start. Um, I think plenty of you have found it. So hi everyone, thanks for joining us. But over there where it says say something nice, um, that's where you can drop uh, any comments or questions. There's also an ask a question button, which looks like a question mark and a speech bubble. So yeah, it'd be great to hear your comments um, and questions as we run through. We can get those answered by the guys at the end. So yeah, if you do have anything, please pop them um, in there. So let's introduce you um, to our speakers today. First up, we've got Jeff Howes from Baxi. Jeff, welcome. Can you just tell us a little bit about your uh, role at Baxi and yourself, please? Morning, Joe. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate you taking time out on uh, what's, you know, getting into the busy time of year for sure. Um, so yeah, my role at Baxi, I'm External Affairs and Policy Director. So effectively, it's dealing with government and policy officials on the future of heat, really. So what's happening with building regs, with decarbonisation, with manufacturing policy. So anything government, it generally comes across my desk. So quite busy at the minute. Busy, yeah, busy, busy time, busy year, busy couple of years. It's an interesting time in terms of a degree of uncertainty. There's an election on the way. Um, there's a lot of chopping and changing of of, of, of um, secretaries of state, for example. So it's been a challenging year for sure. No, brilliant. Uh, next up, we've got Harriet Evans. Harriet, welcome. Can you tell us about your role at Baxi, please? Morning, Joe. Um, my name's Harriet Evans. I'm the Renewables Director at Baxi. Um, I've been with Baxi just over a year and um, I'm working closely with both commercial and residential product marketing groups and also helping the sales teams uh, with their focus to work with installers and consultants in the renewables arena. So lots, lots to do at the moment. Yeah, very exciting. And then we've got uh, Ian Trot. Ian, welcome. Can you tell us about your role, please? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Ian, Ian Trot and uh, I'm the training manager for Baxi Heating. So. I look after sort of residential and commercial uh, across UK and Ireland, and uh, a, a busy time for training at the moment. Obviously, it's uh, it's on on the top of everyone's list really to learn about the new technologies coming. Yeah, it's very hot topic, which is why we've got such a good um, a good turnout for everyone today. So yeah, I will hand over um, to uh, the guys who are going to run through um, a presentation covering all three of those kind of aspects. If you do have any questions or comments as we go, pop them in there. Um, and then uh, we will get those answers to you at the end. So if I hand over to uh, Jeff to yeah. begin with, please. Lovely. OK, um, if we pop to the next slide, please. Um, so what we've got here is an agenda. Um, bear in mind we've got an hour, including questions. So it's going to be a um, uh, fairly whistle stop run through. So I'll just give you a quick look at um, low carbon, what's happening and why, um, what what the government are proposing and what is likely to happen over the next 10, 15 years. And the kicker really is what this means for us on this call. So us as manufacturers, um, but also installers, there's going to be some some significant um, changes coming down the track. Maria will then go through in some more detail from a product support point of view. So how are we helping you guys out there in the field? Um, and how you can best go about sort of meeting this challenge of, of, of low carbon um, where, you know, consumer sentiment and cost it, it are, you know, very much key concerns. And then Ian at the end there, um, all about the training aspect. So this is going to be a pretty fundamental part of the transition is skills and training. Um, you'll have seen in the, in the trade press, no doubt, endless articles about training and skills. Um, we'll just give a quick sort of run through of, of where we are and what we're offering on that. So we could pop to the next one, please. So that that that's me. Um, so the heat challenge. If you've been, this is this is sort of where I get a bit of a disconnect. So so I'm in and out of this stuff all day. It's my job, so I'm sort of geeky about this stuff. But um, if you've been to any decarbonisation webinar or seminar or anything in the last couple of years, you'll have seen these two charts more than likely. So they're from the the government heat and building strategy from a couple of years back and what they're saying is effectively that heat is roughly 23 percent of um overall uk carbon emissions as of 2019 and domestic homes you know homes are about 17 percent so when we start to talk about look we've got to go towards low carbon transport we've got to decarbonize agriculture all these other sectors heat's a relatively big chunk of that so we're increasingly under the microscope from a from a policy perspective um chart on the right shows effectively direct emissions resulting from heating buildings over the last 30 years 
and it's relatively flat. Um, certainly in, in the commercial and the public building sector, relatively flat. Domestic, there's a slight downward trajectory, trajectory, but not to the speed that we need in order to meet 2050. So this is going to help to explain the background of, uh, of why there are certain challenges coming our way. If we could hop to the next one, please. Always throwing a difficult graph to read on a screen is, is one of my tenets for a, for a, for a good presentation. Um, so 2050 is the net zero target. Um, 2045 in Scotland effectively, but 2050 for the UK as a whole. Um, so that means that pretty much every aspect of the economy is going to have to be decarbonised. So that's why we see talk about you know, phasing out um, internal combustion engine cars and moving towards electrification there. We've seen talk about you know low carbon industrial process and you know massively ramping up um, renewable infrastructure on the grid. So in order to track 2050, very on 2050 is you know quite a few years out. There's interim carbon budgets which are also legislative um, and, and carry penalties for not meeting them. So we've effectively started out in this journey back in 1990 with the Kyoto Protocol. Um, when we started to enshrine um, initially an 80% carbon reduction and then net zero into law, we instigated carbon budgets to track progress towards that. So we've met carbon budgets one and two, um, and three is as projected. That's largely been stuff that won't impact upon day-to-day -day homes and businesses. So it's been, you know, more renewables on the grid, it's been decarbonisation of, of manufacturing and even offshoring in some respects, not brilliant for the economy, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's reduced emissions. When we start to hit in towards carbon budgets four and five um, over the next few years, that's where heat really comes into play. Um, so we're going to have to start to make some significant inroads. I say we, we as a nation, not we as, a, as an industry or a business. We as a nation have to make some inroads into homes and businesses. That's where it starts to get sticky because if it's invisible upstream, low impact as far as Joe Public's concerned, it's not an issue. When we start talking about the need to get into homes um, and update people's heating systems and other things, then that obviously comes with a challenge in terms of perception, in terms of cost, in terms of other aspects around that intervention piece. So if we move from there, please, Joe. If you fancy a bit of bedtime reading, there's a good thousand pages or so um, of, of policy speak there. So all of this has been a, a topic of, of discussion in the industry for decades. It's, you know, I've been talking about low carbon for forever, really. Um, as there's this realisation, we're sort of trundling very quickly towards carbon budgets five and six. Uh, government have started to, to, to get more and more um, pointed in terms of what needs to happen. So the first one of any real consequence in the last few years was the 10 point plan. So that was one of Boris Johnson's um, acts or you know, publications under his tenure that came out. And that's where this idea of 600,000 heat pumps a year by 2028 came from. So effectively that's a tenfold increase in, in heat pump market as of today. So we've got to you know, get significant numbers out there. Next came the heating building strategy, which was a bit more considered and thoroughly researched. So that's that's the one to really have a look at if you fancy a, a bit of reading. Um, and that sets out really across all different aspects of, of the built environment from domestic right the way through to commercial and industrial. Where do we start to look at decarbonisation and what are the options? So that's effectively saying heat pumps will be a very important strut of the, of, of the net zero tent, so to speak. Um, but other options like district heat and heat networks, hydrogen and biofuels will play a part. So there's, there's this narrative of a broad spread of, of solutions really in there, but, but heat pumps being sort of front and centre of, of thinking. Next up, we came, well, next up, we, we, we have the, the net zero strategy. Um, that's more grid focused and that's talking about how we're going to get more green electricity out there and then how we can start to meet the demands that you know, lumping effectively a lot of fossil fuel demand onto the grid will, will, will mean. Um, so that, that, again, is a relatively interesting one. Then there's two that you won't be able to read because I can't see them on my screen. So that's that's bad slide making on my part and I apologise. But um, 
there's an open consultation from Vesnes on improving boiler standards and efficiency. That's proposing a few things around improving efficiency and control of, of natural gas boilers in the short term. It proposes that we may see a hydrogen ready boiler mandate. So the proposal is from 2026, boilers that are placed on the market for residential purposes are hydrogen ready by design. So that's a boiler that can work on natural gas out of the box and then convert to hydrogen in the event of a, a localized grid network conversion. Um, and it also talks a lot about hybrids and the potential future role for hybrids as a stepping stone towards a pure heat pump system. So hybrids answer a lot of questions around technical fit, running temperatures um, and what happens in those, those few weeks of the winter when, you know, in some housing stock types, you know, a heat pump may struggle. So, so hybrids are definitely a part there. Last but not least, and pretty topical at the minute, is the energy bill. So that was passed through the last stage of Lord's debate last night um, and is now going for royal assent. So you'll see, um, you'll see royal assent for that in the next week before the King's speech next month. Um, effectively, the energy bill contains a lot of clauses that will enable government to pass legislation. So it's talking about things like the clean heat market mechanism, um, electricity grid reform. Uh, there's a whole host of enabling low carbon policy in there, which, which, which will effectively allow government then to regulate. So the key sort of takeaway from all of these documents is electrification is where we are. We've got Effectively, 2035 is going to be a pretty critical date in terms of decarbonisation. We've got to get you know, over 70% carbon reduction on the way towards net zero by, by 2035. Um, so whilst, whilst hydrogen is there as an option, it won't be a mass market option in that time frame. So government are concentrating rightly on, on, on electrification heat pumps in the short term. With the ambition to prove hydrogen through the trials that are ongoing, there's a policy decision in 2026 as to whether hydrogen is you know, to be taken forward in in, uh, in larger scale or not. But in the interim, you know, heat pumps are definitely the the, uh, the topic of the day. If we can move forward, please, Joe. So as I mentioned, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of policy documents bandied about in the last few years. Um, so this timeline gives a rough top level view of, of, of what's proposed and when. Um, as a caveat, some of the longer term stuff is absolutely subject to consultation. So it's not, you know, chiseled in stone. Don't go away and say this is absolutely happening as of this specific, specific date. These at the moment are proposals that are, need to be ratified. So looking at next year, um, unless Rishi Sunak holds on to the last possible minute, which would mean an election in January 25, um, it's looking very, very likely we'll see an election next year. Um, Everyone will have seen the polling, so we'll, you know we're likely to see a different government next year. Which, reading the room at the party conferences, we might see a slightly different spin on, on net zero um, in terms of ambition and speed. So you'll have seen Rishi Sunak um, did a speech about three weeks ago now, sort of watering down to an extent some of the um, some of the policy around net zero. So you know moving moving the car ban back a few, by five years, uh, moving the proposed oil boiler ban back from 26 to 35, there's a few bits in there. Um, it may be the case that some of that stuff is, is, um, is up for debate again after the election. We also have next year, the Scottish New Build Heat Standard, which will bring in what they're calling zero direct emissions on site. So that means no combustion, um, no, no natural gas, LPG or oil combustion will be allowed in new buildings um, as of probably December next year is, is where that's looking likely to come in. A little bit closer time for us, CHMM is the clean heat market mechanism. So essentially government are saying to boiler manufacturers, you must sell a proportion of heat pumps or face some potentially ruinous financial charges. So. There's a lot of uh, focus and discussion in the press about this at the moment. So we're just waiting on final confirmation of um, of what the targets and the, and, and the, uh, the penalty levels will be on that, which is hopefully in the next couple of weeks. But uh, watch this space on that one. Moving forward to 2025, we've got the future homes and building standard for England and probably Wales. And that, again, will will, will likely see a prohibition on 
um, using fossil fuels in new build. So we're likely to see, if not a straight ban on, on connecting to the gas grid, certainly the SAP framework and the calculation around how you actually get a building across the line for planning will, will, will absolutely favour electrification. So we can see heat pumps and in some smaller house types, direct electric being the, being the go to there. We've got some proposals for heat network zoning in 25. So that means similar to London. So in London at the moment, you've got the London plan. If you're converting or building more than a dozen or so properties, you have to have a heat network or give a very good reason not to. Um, that policy is effectively going to be spread around other major urban centres around the UK in, in 25. So obviously Birmingham, the second city, and some of the smaller places like Manchester and stuff will see um, we'll see similar similar um, planning system proposals coming through. So I touched on um, new boiler standards from the consultation that again we're waiting for the outcome from this um but we'll we'll see some some tighter requirements on gas borders in 2025 potentially a uk specific take on erp or eco design so that's the little colored labels on the side of things from a to g that say how good they are um it's likely we'll see a slightly different take on that as, as one of the brexit's um policy points the government are keen to push through Look at 2026 and mindful of time. Um, we've got the decision on hydrogen for heat, yes or no, as a result of the different trials that are happening. Um, so again, we're, we're invested in that and, getting, and keeping a very close track on things. We've mentioned a potential hydrogen ready boiler mandate. So we should have the, the outcome on that by the end of this year in terms of whether it's a goer or not. But uh, again, we'll just wait and, and, and confirm when we can to the press. Um, and there's some talk around a potential smart heat pump mandate. So this is heat pumps having the ability to interact with the grid and modulate and switch on and off dependent upon local grid conditions and demand. So it's all a flexibility play around avoiding local issues on congestion. For 2028, we've got the 600,000 heat pump ambition. Um, so effectively everything that we're talking about prior to 28 is, is, is how do we get to that 600,000 and, and government pulling levers to get us there. And they're also, as part of the consultation I mentioned, they're talking about a more expansive role for hybrids, maybe even becoming the minimum standard as we're going to see in Holland and some of the other European markets, but very, very much up for debate at the moment. They're moving more into the future from there, 2030 onwards. So we've still got this potential boiler ban in 2035. So we're going to have to stop using gas for heat at some point um, in order to meet the 2050 requirements. The average life cycle of boiler is about 12 to 15 years. So government is saying, look, if we stop the sale of boilers in 2035, that means roughly everyone is off gas by 2050 is the rationale there. So there's some cost and proportionality arguments around that to be done yet. And there's following Rishi Sunak's speech, there's a potential that 20% that of households might be exempted from this ban, but we're waiting on more details on how that might work and, and what, that, what that's going to look like. So there's going to be more consultation on this next year. And they're still in the EPC side, so social homes to EPCC by 2030 is still there. Um, ambition for private homes EPCC by 2035 is still there. Um, SUNAP did kill off EPCC targets for private rented because that was a, a piece of legislation that would penalise landlords if not. Um, whether you agree with that or not, it's something that, that SUNAP's killed off. So all good fun. Um, on to the next one then, please, which is my last slide. So you'll be glad to sort of hear the last of my uh, my brummy tones. Um, what does this mean? So it means a lot of things, really. So we've got a fundamental shift for the industry. So the gas boiler market today is about 1.65 million units per year. 85% um, of homes use natural gas for heating and, and hot water purposes. So that's about 22 and a half million homes. There's roughly 28 million homes that are going to need something done to them in order to get to net zero in terms of emissions and such. So that's going to mean, you know, a mix of technologies. So absolutely electrification and heat pumps front, front and centre um, with the potential for hydrogen, heat networks, other things as, as secondary measures. Um, at the moment, that means skills and accreditation. So, you know, we all know there's 130 odd thousand gas safe engineers quite happily servicing that market of, of installs and, and um, 
and maintenance and, and, and sort of aftercare. Um, there's a big gap between that and, and the number of MCS registered heat pump engineers, which is something that, that Harriet and um, any more follow on with. So there's a definitely a piece around accreditation. So the, the, the game in town at the minute is the border upgrade scheme. That's as of yesterday is now seven and a half thousand pounds grant. Um, in order to access that, you have to be, have an MCS certified product and installation. So again, MCS will start to become more and more important for that reason. Um, but again, skills in general and accreditation, I'll, I'll leave to the, to the following two to, 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 to talk about. Um, smart and connected systems. So with any technology, there's going to be the need to start to connect to the internet to do remote diagnostics, which is already happening now. But you know, smart and connected is, is something that's going to come a lot more strongly across all product groups in the next few years. Hybrids. Um, I could talk all day about it, but I won't. Um, but yeah, they're, they're on the way, they're important. It's something we're going to be talking about in a lot more detail in the next few months. Um, and essentially, new build and social. So new build will be forced through legislation down a certain technology path. That's on the way and that's, that's not likely to change at all. We're seeing social housing um, through their own decarbonisation targets, again, taking a more proactive stance on this stuff. Um, and then with the border upgrade scheme, private homeowners will you know be encouraged but perhaps not legislated until into the 30s to start to make a move so our, our general message is look all of the technologies have a place we've got this balanced approach we're, we're invested in and offer all of it so we're well placed to give an independent um view as to where things are going so i'll hand over to harriet who's going to have um some words of wisdom for you on, on where we are with with our heat pump technology in particular thanks jeff mm. Wonderful, thanks, Joe. Um, Jeff has now set the scene as to why, how, and when decarbonisation is going to happen. Um, for many of you, the transition over to new technologies may be a daunting task. I want to reassure you that at Baxi, we're here to support you, whether you, wherever you are on on your journey. I'm going to focus on the current work we're doing with heat pumps for a short while. We're super busy with installers post our new launch of our Baxi and Baxi Assure Monoblock launch last spring. We have a team of sales engineers, internal pre-sales design and field-based support engineers, all available to provide you with a variety of services, including initial design and selection advice, on-site commissioning support as you learn the ropes and after if you wish to use us, full support and warranty back backup post-sales in the unlikely event that there is a problem. In order to hit government targets, we know you have a huge part to play in supporting you as you grow your knowledge and experience as the, as the industry goes through some significant changes. Can I have the next slide, please? We're working with a huge variety of installers, from total novices through to experienced MCS installers. I just want to touch on MCS a, a little longer. MCS stands for Micro Generation Certification Scheme. It's the body that monitors design and installation quality when claiming the government's either the Boiler Upgrade Scheme or the Hone Energy Scotland grant. And as Jeff's mentioned, these grants are available to homeowners when you replace a fossil fuel heating system with a low carbon alternative. All installations have to be carried out within strict MCS guidelines. Uh, recent increase to the new boiler upgrade scheme and now making a switch to heat pumps far more viable for homeowners. The grant has increased to £7,500 in England and Wales. And in Scotland, you can actually get a grant for up to £9,000 if you're in a rural upgrade area. In addition, the government Eco4 funding is available to low income households. And we have recently seen a significant increase in the demand for heat pumps after buildings have undergone their initial insulation upgrades. Plus there are numerous other initiatives to encourage homeowners to take a serious look. VAT free installations, favourable loans and mortgage rates are all coming into effect, plus reduced energy tariffs if you're using a heat pump. These are regular discussions we're now holding with various bodies and fully supporting. If you're not an MCS installer, please don't panic. We can help you with two options, either to become one or alternatively, we can introduce you to an umbrella providers who we are working closely with. 
they will oversee your designs and grant application and we will oversee your commissioning support at the same time. Whichever route you take, we would still encourage you to upskill your engineers sooner rather than later, provide the very best design solutions and the very best installation standards um, for you to properly heat a home in a decarbonized way. Next slide, please. Before I hand over to Ian to talk about the training, I just want to touch on the work we're focusing on right now and the objectives we have set. We are in the fortunate position to talk to hundreds of contractors and homeowners every day. We appreciate that making change is not always easy or a quick decision to make, but we have the responsibility to help encourage transition over and welcome technology changes, however long it takes. We include you as installers in that journey of education. Monoblock heat pumps are the buzzword today um, in residential, but we also have many other technologies driven uh, in development. Uh, Jeff's alluded to these specifically heat networks, district heating and lots of smart connectivity is all, is all coming soon. We really want to take you on the journey with us as this industry grows through dramatic change. So I'll now hand over to Ian to talk about how we plan to help you do just that. Yeah. Oh, do we do we have you? Ian? You might be on uh, on mute. Does look like Ian has frozen. Ah, well, if, Ian might be having some technical issues, so I'll try and. Oh, here we go. We'll try and get him back up again. Are you with us, Ian? He's still on mute. Yeah, is your microphone muted, Ian? Um, is that any better? Oh, it does look like Ian is having some uh, technical issues. Um, pop onto the first slide, Joe, and we'll see. Uh, yeah, is this something that we can muddle through between? I'm sure we can. Um, I'll I'll crack on until Ian manages to rejoin us. Um, we're providing a number of different training journeys depending on what level you're at. So. Um, Initially, most um, of the installers or plumbers that are working with Baxi will have probably been invited to a product familiarization days. Day. These, are, these are connected to um, either a current boiler uh, course that they may be on, or we now do a dedicated full day where they can learn a little bit more about heat pump technology and the, the journey they need to go on to become a, a heat pump installer. Should they want to progress that journey, uh, they then would move on to a heat pump accredited course. Um, we actually offer a BPEC um, heat pump course from Baxi. This is accredited um, by the government and uh, Bayes are actually also funding these courses at the moment. So we're really encouraging people who want to, to get into heat pumps to start working with heat pumps as soon as possible. So post BPEC course, which does not have to be done with Banksy, it can be done with a variety of other colleges as well. We then have a couple of Banksy heat pump installer days that we would encourage people to, to join up for. Um, first one is design and application. This is really suitable for anyone who's just completed their BPEC. We take people through the full uh, process of how they design um, a heat pump system. There's quite a bit of focus on the MCS rules as part of that. Uh, they don't have to become an MCS installer, as I've already said, but they will need to follow the process if they're going to work to uh, to claim boiler up upgrade scheme um, via an umbrella company or in their own right. So designing an application is a one day course. Um, we feel um, the bulk of heat pumps that get bad press in the UK are because they haven't been designed uh, correctly. So it's really, really important that uh, people fully understand the difference between sizing a boiler and sizing a heat pump. And then day two of our specific days are installation and commissioning. These days are, this day is fully focused on the practical use of our heat pump. It's a hands-on course. There's lots of um, 
hands-on application to learn. So it, that course is important that it's actually based in a training center and not an online course. Um, post those two courses, uh, we are confident that any new engineer will be able to then go out and promote uh, the benefits of heat pumps to their customers, to their homeowners. Um, and reappearing. Hopefully you can hear me now. Can we can hear you, can hear you now. Oh, sorry about that, everyone. No, uh, apologies. Yeah, um, Harriet yeah, has no, done just... a fantastic job of going through the slides already. But yeah, I'll, you yeah, can wait. carry on. I just got like... Ian to the installation and commissioning day, which we've just finished. So uh, covering off those so, two so, Okay, so um, I'm sure Harriet's covered this already. But but um, when we talk about familiarisation days, we talk about heat pumps and uh, boiler days. And and what I would say is. Wherever you are on your on your heat pump journey, if you're at the beginning of that that um, let's call it a low carbon journey or the, the 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 transition in how we heat our homes, even if you think actually no, I'm I'm not going to move into that arena, um, you're going to have to know about the, the the new technologies because as new builds come off of their two year um, warranty period, they're going to be in your marketplace. So I would encourage anyone to get on to a, a product day on whatever technology that they're, they're interested in, whether that's heat pump or heat networks or hydrogen in the future or whatever other technologies come along. That's your first step really into understanding where they'd fit into your portfolio and then taking on to your next journey. And I'm sure Harriet's covered, and I heard some of the, Eric covered about the, the heat pump journey, about how you become, go from where you are today as a heating engineer into into becoming somebody who's really quite specialist in in heat pump um, uh, in this particular event, heat pumps, and then heat work networks for for later on. Um, so also that we'll have a a, a range of uh, courses online, and and that's going to be a, a, you'll see a change uh, in how people learn, I think, and and and, and we're seeing that already. So um, with e learning, and we we already do training Tuesdays, of course, which are, are snippet videos just to give you a, an insight into a particular area, but. But a lot of this learning is, is going to move online and it's going to be available uh, effectively when you are available rather than having to come to training centres. And I just caught the end of what Harriet was saying about bringing you in to look at the heat pumps. That's really important that, that, that we need to say that online doesn't replace uh, face to face training. It doesn't replace getting your hands on and actually being able to see it in a, in a real life situation. Uh, it enhances it. It's there to it's there to basically enhance that whole experience and maybe give you some pre-learning as well. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and of course, we do video tutorials already and that will continue into 2024 uh, and beyond. Um, and, and looking at 2024 from a training perspective, uh, we've got on the list there, we've got heat networks, um, which include heat interface units, which I'll discuss a little bit in a minute, and, and low temperature design. And these are the courses we will be pushing into 2024 because it doesn't really matter whether you are fitting a, a gas boiler or a heat pump or you're working on a heat network. Most of these are going to be moving towards, if they're already there, low temperature. And if we can reduce the amount of um, carbon you know, we, we produce just by controls, and Jeff alluded to this when he was talking about making systems smart. That's not just for heat pumps. If we can control our heat, if you can get to understand how beneficial low temperature um, heating is for your customer, you can do that on gas boilers today. You can make your gas boiler more efficient and uh, make your, your system, that system is then much more suitable for a, for a heat pump in the future, even if it's not the right technology for it now. What, what's really important training wise for, for, for where we are and where we're going to move to is that you keep up with technology. You know, and manufacturers like Baxi, you know, we're, we're going to have to be at the forefront of delivering that technology to you in a way that you can understand, in a way you can access. Uh, because if you don't set up with technology, you'll get left behind. Because whether you, whether you want to change what you're doing or not, the heating industry is changing. And it's changing for a reason, and we all have to really get onto that journey. I would, I would say, get onto it now rather than wait until you're forced to do it. Become an expert up front, and then give the best advice to your customers. So that's all, really. I wanted to say and thank Harriet for Harriet for for stepping in uh, and saving the day. Um, and I think now we're going to move on to the questions. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Yeah, apologies for the the slight technical issue, and thank you, Harriet, for um for stepping on that one. Because if that was just me and Ian that would have been uh, much more challenging. Um, but yeah, if you do have any questions or comments, please pop them in where it says say something nice. Tony uh, has asked, his question for the panel is, um, what are Baxi doing to support the take up of the new 
low carbon heating technician apprenticeship. Is that one for you, Ian? Uh, yeah, I would expect so. So um, all apprenticeships are, are really important at the moment. And we have in the heating industry, and it's replicated across um, across all of well, most construction sectors, really. We have a lot of engineers, uh, I say my age, who are who are no longer young. Uh, and um, and we've got a, a gap in the middle where we haven't invested in apprentices. That is changing now. And, and at Baxi, we are investing in apprenticeships and we are having apprentices, not just heating apprenticeships, uh, but, you know, and a matter actually site at, uh, at Preston as well. And we've done that for a number of years now. But we don't just stop there because because we have the um, uh, effective. There is a government levy on uh, uh, the apprenticeship levy where the government, if you if you your payroll is over a certain amount, you have to put into that levy. And we use that money to support our Baxi approved installers. If they want an apprentice, you know, they can help with that as well. And, and to answer the question specifically about low carbon technology, it's really important to get the next generation coming through just so familiar with low, uh, low carbon technologies and low, heat, uh, low temperature heating. So it's just normal to them because that's where we're heading. So we also uh, support the, the, that and we do it in varying ways. We have our own low carbon apprenticeships uh, going on at the moment and we expect to do that again next year. Um, that's in conjunction with, uh, with a college in Birmingham. Uh, we'll do whatever we can to support that fundamentally. Um, hopefully that's answered your question. I suppose the thing is, though, um, like you said, if you yourself as a gas engineer haven't retrained or upskilled or whatever word we're going to use to work on these technologies, it's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? You would have to go through that process first to then start to, to um, generate the jobs and all that to then warrant taking on an apprentice. So, again, it's like to your point, you, we need to be kind of thinking about this now if you want to make it part of your business portfolio. Yeah, we can't we can't rely just on one. We can't rely on the colleges who are really important, just pushing low carbon apprentices through. We need we need to, you know, to it's a push and pull. Isn't it? We, do, we push them through, um, you know, through the apprenticeship route, but we need the pull of work as well. So we need to we need the established businesses to actually start taking on low carbon work and upskilling their own existing workforce to help with that transition across. Yeah, because you need the help, but you need the jobs to have the help. So yeah, it's get yourself trained up, and then if you if you feel like you're at a position where you'd like to to take on an apprentice and you don't know where to start, they can go to you guys as Baxi, and you can help matchmaking all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Harry, what would you say? Like, um, I kind of Ian may be alluded to it. Then it, it's still a bit a busy time for um, heating engineers putting in gas boilers. They're still the kind of heat emitter of choice. People know about them. Their distress purchases and all that sort of stuff. So. If you're a, a, a sole trader or an SME and you're you're pretty much at capacity with the work that you're doing, what's your advice then to make this transition to heat pumps? Because we know it's coming um, for all the reasons that we've spoken about today, but there is a business case for it. When, when do I do it? I've got enough work. How long can I kind of go on for? What would your advice be for engineers who are maybe in that boat in 2023? I, I think um, the real advice is, I would get, say is do a bit of planning. Um, yes, it's a way off before everyone's going to be forced to use low carbon technology, but actually it's, it's really not that far off. Um, in seven years, we're going to have potentially a complete change in uh, and turnaround about what you can put in a property. So I would say um, if you're completely new to heat pumps, just get yourself on a familiarisation day. Um, they're there to help reassure you that fitting a heat pump is not actually that complicated. Um, and I think just get to grips with being familiar with options. Your homeowners are going to start asking you about heat pumps really soon. And if you don't understand the basics and give a stock answer of, oh, they're not coming for ages, that's not actually correct anymore. So I would say take your time, get familiar with uh, heat pumps. The BPEC course actually takes uh, a full three days, followed by some water regs training. So plan that in to do sometime next year and then follow it up with some manufacturers courses uh, to, to help give you reassurance that actually it, we are there to support you. Um, and it's really not that scary a journey. I think my key thing is you've got time to, to plan now in a few years time. There will be complete swamping of courses. Um, even we are really busy with courses now. Um, so now is the time to just plan in a few of your, maybe the, your younger engineers who've got a passion for a bit more of a, a green look at uh, the future. 
get them familiar with heat pumps, start talking to homeowners about it. Because if they can't talk to you about it, you can bet they're going to go and talk to somebody else. So uh, don't get left out would be my advice. We just had a question from um, Adam about why are installers coming um, out of training colleges recommending heat pumps coupled with radiators. It's kind of the design that you were mentioning. So as Baxi, you mentioned that you you support installers with the, the design because it is different um, and it may be a bit of a, a, a kind of lost art because the boiler is so kind of easy to install and forgiving. What what support, what design support does that look like for people who, because that might be putting people off. Um, what, what kind of what are I, the solutions for those one, hurdles? Please. Yeah, please. Again, um, heat pump design is not so different to a traditional design. Um, the main difference between a heat pump design and a boiler design is you've got to find room for a storage cylinder, uh, which you don't obviously need with a combi boiler. But we still recommend uh, radiators uh, throughout a property, possibly included with some um, lower temperature underfloor heating on the ground floor. But radiators is still part of a heat pump design as well. Um, there's lots of myths that radiators have to be enormous and and cope to cope with a lower temperature. But actually, there's some great radiators now um, where we just size radiators correctly rather than um, use what may be in there at the moment. But quite often, we can use existing radiators too. It, it's uh, perfectly it's part of the design consideration. And then on the training courses, this is what the installers will learn. It's like we, we had a, a couple um, of webinars last week. One of them was with the APAC and they said it kind of used to be a rule of thumb industry. Rule of thumb kind of work. Now, everything, whether it's a boiler or a heat pump, kind of needs to be a bit more accurate. Is this the sort of stuff that, that you go over? Can you use underfloor heating versus um, yeah, radiators? What pipe sizes do we need? What pump speeds do we need? And all that sort of stuff. Absolutely. All, all of that is covered on our um design and application course and hopefully we're also providing a design tool quite shortly so uh, it, you will you will learn about the theory of design but you will also have um, a good selection tool to help back up uh, the theory it's important you understand the theory though rather than just uh, just not understand it it's not a black art it's very quite it's quite straightforward that is it's also a legality thing isn't it because if you you do use an external designer but you have put the system in you as the technician are responsible for that installation so if there are any problems if you don't have a working understanding you can fall into the trap of just oh well i did what i was told if that is an issue the liability still sits with you as the engineer doesn't it so it is important to have that understanding yes absolutely and um if you are an mcs installer you will understand the process if you are using an umbrella company they will be guiding you on design, but it's still really important you understand it. Mm. And you also need to spend time surveying that property rather than just a rule of thumb for any type property. That's the really important bit to get right to, to have an effective heat pump design. There's actually a couple of bits in building regulations as well, which sort of went under the radar to an extent last year. So we had an update to Partel in England, um, and we've got Section 6 in Scotland, which is obviously slightly different, but much the same message. So um, any new heating systems, this is predominantly new build at the moment, has to have a maximum flow temperature of 55 degrees. So it's all about this low temperature heating system. Um, and if you have obviously a, a complete new system, so new pipe work, new rads in, in an existing building, the same applies. At the time, there was a lot of discussion about should this become the norm across, you know, boiler swaps and installations in general. So that caused a lot of debate about cost effectiveness and time to install and all that good stuff. Um, and, and was thankfully at the time sort of pushed back, but that that could well return as a discussion point. You Which, mentioned Jeff, yeah, in that in those regulations, the boiler regulations and the ERP coming out in 2025. Is that something that could be added on? Is that what you're kind of alluding to? Um, yes and no, you, you, the, the vehicle to do it would be building regulations, um, right, okay. the system thing rather than the product thing. Um, but ERP, when that comes through, we'll start to look at, you know, more stringent modulation ratios and such that would actually support lower temperature ac across the board as well. So for engineers as well, that's coming in the next couple of years, whether you're working on heat pumps or not, isn't it? So that's, again, something that you need to get, talk to Ian and get on a course to kind of understand, because pretty soon that's going to be a you have to have rather than nice to have absolutely and as ian said you know a couple of years time it will get to the point where all these new builds are dropping into the the cycle of um you know 
um, maintenance and such for you know the general population of installers that that maybe not don't work in new build. All of these newer houses will start to sort of filter through in the next couple of years, so there'll be a need to work on them. Uh, Ian, we've got a couple of questions about uh, more about the training. Uh, will the courses be coming to Scotland? Um, is one of the quite specific uh, questions. Uh, yes, is the answer to that. Um, so, so we have a satellite training centre which we partner with um, uh, in Scotland, uh, and we already do heat pump courses out there. We've brought the Baxter heat pump installer course um, to Scotland, uh, and we'll either deliver deliver the BPEC course there, or we will get you know, or we'll partner with them and they will deliver it. Um, but but there will be access to it either way. Um, just before we move on to the next one, which would just do you want to go what Harriet was saying about the 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 uh, design side, which is really important. It's funny, but it's nothing new. This is yeah, you know, and there's been a few comments on there I've seen about um, you, you need to calculate heat loss. That's uh, that's exactly what we did in the industry when I joined the industry. There was absolutely nothing new to that. The the, the difference is, as you've alluded to, is is we've stopped doing it um, and then because we've made boilers so good and so easy to fit uh, and we've got modulation controls and we've got thermostatic valves and that so that's sort of fallen out of favor if you like it's just it's just really um honing our skills again it's nothing to really to be scared about um and and then you're working to different temperatures but but the fundamentals are all the same as harriet mentioned as well there are lots of handy apps for all of this stuff from manufacturers that will help so again when you start talking about you know um kelvins and all that sort of stuff it does seem a bit like yeah here's the long hand but you don't need to do that because there's an app that will do it for you you, 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 you right. don't but as as harriet really quite rightly said she's she said that yeah it's important to you learn the fundamentals so i'm a great believer in that yeah absolutely use your app once you understand how to do it without the app yeah so get on a training course learn how to design low temperature heating and and then absolutely go away and use your app because you then understand why you're doing what you're doing and you're more likely to do it uh, we also got is the BPEC course a one off or does it need to be renewed like ACS does? It's, it's a renewal, and I think what, what the question is aimed at there is you know, in, in years gone by, they were what they used to call evergreen, um, uh, but that's gone now and it'll be a five year renewal. And then we talk a lot about installs, heat pump installs. We need to install 600,000 heat pumps a year, etc. 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 What we don't talk as much about is the kind of servicing behind them as well. So, obviously, boilers you fit it. And then ideally you would then as the local engineer service that boiler every year get it to its 15 year life cycle again it's a process that everyone's kind of used to are you guys working on that side of it with the heat pumps is there a heat pump commissioning course is that covered in it um what are your thoughts on that one well we have that installation commissioning course which will, which will cover that we're also looking at um uh, in 2024 uh, delivering a a service and maintenance course for heat pumps and aimed exactly at the, the, the type of person who thinks actually installing heat pumps is not for me, but the, I'm seeing heat pumps on my marketplace now and I don't want to miss out. And it's a real opportunity for people because they do need to be serviced. Um, and, and we go on about design and we go on about getting it right. Uh, you know, otherwise the heat pump won't perform correctly. Well, that service is, is just as important to maintain that performance. So you need to go there and to clean the unit out and check it's operating correctly. And that's an opportunity for, for everyone on the call actually to expand their business into that area. Even if they're not fitting heat pumps uh, currently, then, uh, then they're, they're still going to need to know about them. And then how is, is the warranties on, on heat pumps, is that tied in with that as well? It's going to need an annual service as your boiler would to, to register. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as well as, as well as um, maintaining a heat pump for warranty, it's also for efficiency. If you don't clean out the coils, if you don't keep debris away from those coils, it's not going to work as, work as effectively and the, the cost to run it is going to go up. So it, it's a twofold thing. But yeah, absolutely. Warranty is really important. Um, and if you want it, you've got to look after the kit. So Exactly. And it's a, it's quite, a, it is with your heat, your current heating system, but a boiler, it, it is quite a big outlay, isn't it, compared to, so you're, it's in your interest to keep it running as efficiently as possible as a homeowner. And it's in your interest to offer that service as an engineer because it's repeat business for your business. Yeah, quite agree. It's uh it's exactly like any piece of kit. If you don't look after it, it won't last so long. So, or be as efficient. Um, and then, Jeff, just on uh, your points, you were talking about um, uh, hybrid systems. So, this isn't something that's currently in the boiler upgrade scheme, is it? But it's something that it does make a lot of sense on paper for that transition. People know what a boiler is. There may be some hesitancy to, to change. This is a great way to kind of bridge that gap. Again, for engineers, you know what the boiler part of the system does. You do the heat pump part of the system, and then that's a transition thing. What what 
what are you expecting to come out of that um, in the next couple of years for the hybrids? So it's an interesting place for hybrids in the UK. So it's something that's been almost ignored to an extent by yeah. by, by policy. Um, and there's been a real mix of opinion across different stakeholders at government as to whether they're something that, that you know should be pursued or not. Um, in the meantime, as is usual with this stuff, you know the continent have moved on and, and, the, and the European markets have, have really pushed these things out. So in in the Netherlands, um, from 2026, you can't install a standalone gas boiler. It has to be a hybrid as a minimum, um, which is interesting. Um, and we've also seen some, some pretty strong subsidy schemes across other European member states to sort of promote hybrids as being, you know, a stepping stone, if you like, towards full electrification. Um, they make a great deal of sense for a lot of reasons. So, you know, as you've mentioned, one of the things we do hear back from homeowners is all oh, of here stuff in the Daily Mail or whatever that heat pumps don't keep my houses warm and all this good stuff. So you get this sort of this this crutch, if you like, of having a gas boiler to fall back on when it gets properly cold. Um, although you don't really need it for a heat pump system, it's it's a psychological thing, but it's there. Um, there's also the opportunity to if you've got a perfectly good working boiler, it doesn't make a great deal of sense from a whole life cost perspective to chuck it out after it's been in for five six years. So there is the proposal that we we could have. A, an add-on system so you can actually put a small heat pump and an interface unit onto an existing boiler system to make a hybrid that way. Um, obviously we prefer it if it was a full hybrid from the start because you know we get more of our products in but fine it's an, op it's an option. Um, and to pick up on Robert's point in the chat about extra demand placed upon the power system, again we're having a lot of promising discussions with network operators on hybrids as a means for them to balance their balance and manage their loads in congested areas so if you've got a smart meter and a hybrid that has the ability to, to, to actually interface with, with such you can then start to prioritize load across the two different appliances depending on what's happening so you'd normally do that to chase cost saving or carbon saving in the event of it's getting a bit congested and then we're going to have a trouble you know trouble keeping the electricity up in a certain area you can actually start to do some smart things with hybrids to avoid to avoid that um so it's in some respects, it's a bit of a win-win-win, and it's a sensible, sensible sort of interim technology that, uh, that 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 we'd like to see more more support for. So, I mentioned that government have been a little bit down on it, or almost sort of looking the other way for, to an extent for a while. Um, that's starting to change. Um, I think very much under the realization we're going to have to get six hundred thousand heat pumps out there to meet this this sort of objective, this commitment, and hybrids can help with that. Uh, would, so would those hybrids then count towards towards that number? Would would could you argue that that's kind of taken the easy way out because it is in schools, but it's obviously not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes and no. Um, and to your point on um, subsidies, well, so at the moment in England there's no subsidy for hybrids. Um, you can feasibly get support for it through the social housing decarbonisation fund, but nobody's claiming it at the moment uh, for for that technology. In Scotland, you can get funding for for a hybrid installation under the low um low carbon home grant um but we're we're pushing to actually get them in the, uh, some partial recognition of water upgrade scheme um purely because you know if, if, if there's a grant of maybe one or two thousand towards it then then the, you know the, the the financials work and it starts to become a lot more attractive and then on the boiler upgrade scheme as well like you said uh, the recent announcement that it's, it's been moved up uh to seven and a half thousand pounds is this something that you think is going to continue for the foreseeable future and not just be a pot of money that is available now and then a new government comes in and it's gone yeah for sure so it's an interesting point so we lobbied from the beginning that that the border upgrade scheme at 5k wasn't enough to to really spark demand in the market to the level that's needed um seven and a half k seems to be doing that okay so i'm hearing anecdotes from the market of you know some supply seeing a 500 percent increase in in um inquiries whether that filters through to installs is another thing but inquiries is, is, is a good thing um under the the off gem stats of water upgrade scheme they're saying the average install cost is about 13k for, for a monoblock air source heat pump with all the supporting work that's needed so obviously you take seven and a half off that you're into a reasonable position um but we're also seeing some analysis that shows more modern houses maybe 1960s and, and, and later can actually be done at a, at a much lower cost than 13 so it's going to get to the point where we see some very very low cost heat pump installs perhaps even cheaper than a boiler swap um in, in some circumstance uh, circumstances so 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 bus is going to drive it in that way um the overall budget 
is an interesting one. So there's been a couple of changes since it was announced and rolled out. So, so initially, bus was for three years, and there was sufficient budget to do roughly 30,000 incomes a year under, under the, the funding envelope. In There's been a three or four different sets of announcements, really, that have, have, that have changed things a little bit. So bus now runs to 2028 under current plans, and it may well be extended from there, depending on how the market goes and where residual prices lie when, when, when the, the funding will be withdrawn. Um, we've had a long discussion with the department over headline um, budget. So obviously at seven and a half thousand pounds versus five thousand pounds, the budget goes less far. So you've got you know, less money to spread around. So it's, Yeah, it goes quicker, but not as many. Exactly that. So um, effectively what they're saying is, look, we're keeping tabs on what's happening at the minute because the bus is massively underspent. I think year one was about a third of the budget was, was, that was available was taken. Um, so there's enough budget there to support it for the time being. But there is a wider decarbonisation pot. There's about six billion of, of public spending sort of earmarks for decarbonisation in the round. So, so the, the, the sort of received wisdom is they could flex that pot to, to upgrade the bus or add into the bus budget if it's needed. OK, yeah. So but again, if you're an engineer and you want to be part of this because it's so attractive to homeowners, you need to be MCS registered. So you need to start now getting on this process because you need to get trained up. You need to get your business in order. There are umbrella schemes and stuff you can do. But yeah, it's you can see how it's exciting for homeowners and they're going to probably want their local engineer to do that. So that the message again is start thinking about this stuff now. Yeah, but we'll just um one more for you, uh, Ian. It's just if for people who do want to start booking on a course and starting their journey, where do they go? Who do they talk to? What's the best kind of um advice um, for that? Well, if, if they want to go on to a familiarisation day, then talk to their local ASM, which they'll be able to find on the Baxi website, baxi.co.uk. Um, for training courses, specific training courses, uh, for example, the BPEC, if you go on to baxi.co.uk forward slash training, you know, all available courses are on there. Uh, and if you're on a because of course, and like Harriet said, we are quite subscribed at the moment. There, are, there is government funding for courses, uh, which we are hoping they will extend uh, into next year. Uh, we haven't, that's not confirmed yet, but we're hoping that. Um, and so whilst the funding is there, now's the time to do the course because that funding won't be there forever. And, and when it becomes business as usual, the funding will, will disappear. So I'd, I'd advise people to get on and get, get looking and get booked on now. Yeah, perfect. We've got the, um, there's the, that uh, URL there as well, backseat.co.uk forward slash HP and so on. So just check out the Baxi website and talk to your rep because I'm, yeah, there's there's plenty of ways to do it. But thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. This session, a few of you have asked, is going to be available to watch on demand. So as soon as we finish, it's the same link and you'll be able to fast forward and rewind. So you'll be able to go to those slides, potentially that Jeff had up, pause them, um, take them in a, a little bit more. And also, if you have any kind of friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from this, if you send them the link, they can register um, and watch it all back as well. All the chat and all the questions and all that stay exactly the same. Um, so you'll be able to, to catch up at your leisure. So thank you, everyone, for your time today. If you do have any more questions, pop them in that chat box and we can get back to you afterwards. And thank you uh, to the panel for your time and your presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.